We see the existing system that was designed for us, and we think that's the only possibility, and that's the best possibility, because otherwise someone else would have thought about it. Right? So most people are not able to, you know, think outside this box that's created for them and realize that, you know, if you rely on a central party to take care of you, at some point you will wake up realizing that they actually were there in the first place to take care of themselves. So imagine you get hired and your employer cuts your pay every year. That would be crazy, but that's exactly what's happening. And the biggest thing people need to understand is the system is taking advantage of you while you are trained to trust it. So kind of reprogram your mind and understand how to protect yourself against the system. All right, Sina, welcome to Bitcoin for Millennials. Thanks, happy to be here. Yeah, thanks so much for coming on. I really enjoy your uh, analysis, the videos that you share, and uh, I think it's uh, it's going to be really interesting to to have this talk. I am personally not an analyst like you, so I think it's good from time to time to have someone on who's deep in in the research. So I'm um, I'm super excited to talk today. But uh, yeah, I just wanted to start first with your background and how you got into uh, Bitcoin. Yeah. Okay. So let's begin with uh, my my own background. I am trained as an engineer. Then I uh, got a degree in uh, I, IT, and then another one, a PhD in business. After that, I uh, so business. Uh, I did it in Arizona State. Then I moved to MIT for a postdoc. So long at school, but then I also was working at some uh, tech companies uh, in between, um, mostly as you know, business analyst and uh, developing uh, new new uh, algorithms and things like that. Then I began my career as a professor uh, at a few different institutions, um, and uh, I spend most of my time <clears throat> research and teaching. Actually, yesterday our semester just began, and um, cool. so yeah, we are uh, getting busier and busier with that. But uh, most of the job is actually uh, research. So, I, I uh, the typical type of research I do is I collect some data related to business and um, answer interesting questions that you know managers might find interesting. And uh, I've been doing that for, I don't know, like at least 10 years. And uh, now I'm trying to do, you know, use some of that skill set to uh, understand Bitcoin better and bring bring the audience, uh, you know, some some insights, hopefully. Yeah, very cool. I think you're uh, I didn't know you were a teacher, but I think that explains also your style of video. I think it's very informative and very in-depth. So, I, uh, yeah, I personally really enjoy it. What was what was your journey then into Bitcoin coming from this more like business um, business background? Yeah, you know, um, just by virtue of uh, you know reading a lot about business, I uh, came across um, uh, blockchain um, in 2015. In 2015, I think, uh, as as uh, you know, as its business applications were growing, I was interested in understanding how it works. Actually, even back then. Um, uh, it was, there was, you know, some good resources on the, on the blockchain technology and how, how, you know, the cryptography works because I had the background in IT. I had taken in cryptography, I had taken cryptography classes, so I knew how it works. So I quickly picked up the tech, but I didn't pick, uh, the finance side of it because, you know, I was a poor PhD student and I had no money and no time to think about investment. So. I got into, I, I began buying uh, late and I'm kicking myself for it, but you know, you gotta accept. Uh, <laughs> everyone gets uh, gets uh, in a, at their own pace. Yeah. But uh, yeah, so I, I uh, you know, got a you know, relatively earlier exposure to it and uh, um, it, it sounded fascinating, you know, from the start. But every year you learn something new and you you discover something completely different. So it's it's a super complex and super deep uh, subject with close application and close impact on your personal life. Yeah, yeah, I love that you say that. I think I I have the same right. Like you can research the content or how it works, but once you understand all the topics or dimensions that it touches, right from 
money to value to energy, physics, all these things. It's uh, I, I think that's what people mean, you know, when we talk about the endless rabbit hole in that sense. It uh, it, it touches so many dimensions. What what was your aha moment? Can you remember? Because if you first got in touch through like blockchain application, of course there were other projects that that you might have looked at. Um, funny enough, no. I mean, a lot of Bitcoiners say that they had they had to go through a cycle of altcoining. Uh, I don't want to use the other problem, more the technical term for it, <laughs> yeah. but uh, use a less accurate term, altcoin. Uh, but for some reason, I you know I wasn't drawn to that area, and uh, you know for, I was probably fortunate that I didn't burn there, but. Uh, mostly uh, looking at Bitcoin, but I've been following the business applications and I've been seeing firsthand that, you know, how how much people over promise in the beginning, you know, and uh, they, they began to solve all of our problems with blockchain and turns out, you know, money so far is the only uh, only proper use case we've found. Everything else is just promises and, you know, year after year, uh, they don't they don't materialize and i've seen myself you know ibm's blockchain team getting dismantled after mm -hmm. over promising for many years and then actually we had a conference and some of the their engineers came to came to mit for a blockchain conference we were chatting with them and you know I, we were kind of challenging them what you're proposing is just a more glorified database and you're yeah. just calling it blockchain and at the end you know they sort of agreed and said this is this is a good marketing for bringing CEOs to the table. So if we just call it a, if we can call it a blockchain project, and if it brings CEOs to at the same table to share the data, who cares? And that was a that was a good answer, you know. <laughs> so it true. Uh, it, yeah. it has some practical application, marketing marketing value, but uh, yeah, money is the key part of this. And to answer your question about the aha moment, I think what really made it click for me you know i had taken quite a bit i had qu quite a bit of education in economics and money and business so i didn't have trouble understanding the value of money like this my biggest problem as i was learning about it, it was uh, if it's gonna get killed by the government because mm. i i totally understood the importance of you know money outside of government control and it always felt crazy that every country has their own money and they essentially if you look at it deeply you realize it's a barter it's a you know 50,000 year old technology of bartering currencies against each other yeah so we invented all this money and all this you know elaborate trade technologies to simplify trade but now we are kind of we have in the last uh, hundred years we've gone back to bartering um and it doesn't it didn't make sense but it did make sense to me that we need a common language across the world right and right now before bitcoin appeared um different countries in the world had a coalesced around the dollar right so we needed something and mm -hmm. the dollar became that and and if you look at the forex trades that usually you know for 90 percent of the trades dollar is on the other side. So it's actually yeah. de facto the common currency that we badly need. So I understood we need a proper, proper common language. But I also thought that if it's like that, then governments will kill it. It took me some time to really understand how decentralization works and how resilient it can be and what kind of what kind of resistance it can it can put up against uh, intervention from the government. So once I fully understood that this thing is bulletproof, as as bulletproof as it gets uh, in terms of government capture, then that was when I said, okay, this is it, liquidate everything. And like within two three months, I moved everything I had in everything else into Bitcoin because you know after. I would buy a little bit, and then two weeks later, I would think, "What? What the hell am I? Uh, you know, why the hell am I keeping so much money in in uh, the S and P five hundred? Is that that's not going to outperform Bitcoin?" So then I would sell that and move that to Bitcoin. Little by little, I did that to everything, and yeah, you know, after a while, nothing else was left. 
Does your Bitcoin custody setup keep you up at night? Gain peace of mind with OnRamp and their multi-institution custody solution. OnRamp creates a dedicated multi-signature vault for you and three separate institutions each hold a key, which are OnRamp, Bitco, and CoinCover. But none of them can move funds unilaterally, only you have control. These institutions can only sign with your instruction. OnRamp's multi-institution custody eliminates single points of failure, reduces your personal attack service and technical burden, and provides access to financial services that allow you to secure your Bitcoin, including inheritance planning, insurance-backed warranties for all balances and transactions, low-cost trading, and more. Check out onrampbitcoin.com through my link in the description below and receive $250 in Bitcoin when you join. If you want to self-custody your Bitcoin stack, I recommend the Foundation Passport, a premium Bitcoin-only hardware wallet. I've been using mine for about a year now, and I love the design and ease of use. And with Foundation's mobile wallet companion app Envoy, your initial onboarding is super smooth and straightforward. The Passport is fully air-gapped, which means you never have to connect it to the internet or any computer. The Passport serves as a signing device to sign transactions on your Envoy app, or any of your other favorite software wallets like Sparrow or Blue Wallet. The Foundation Passport also offers encrypted backups on a micro SD card and is built with 100% open source hardware and software. I love what Zach and the team at Foundation are building. And to learn more about their mission, please check out episode 27 of this podcast. If you consider buying a Foundation Passport, you can use code BRAM, that's B-R-A-M, to get $10 off at foundation.xyz slash BRAM. I, I love that. That's full conviction. Uh, could, could you explain a bit about um, how you rationalize this uh, bulletproof argument? I uh, actually today I got a bit X miner, which I think is part of the eventual, uh, you know, proliferation of more decentralization. Right? This is only a two hundred dollar or hundred fifty dollar uh, miner now, and everyone can can start mining and and secure the network. What? What would be the simplest explanation that that got you to the um, conclusion of it being bulletproof? Uh, to 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 be short, you know, I realize that this is more like an idea that's in people's heads. Technology is secondary, right? You and if you're a government, you can you know block fiat on ramps or little parts of the system but you can't you can't force people to to f abandon this idea you mm -hmm. know yeah. so it's kind of like a belief some people make it you know whatever religion you have some people may you know uh, make draw parallels to that to that religion in an in a geography is in people's heads there's no you know you can burn the books as much as you want it's it's in people's heads and they want yes. it so unless you can control every single person there's no way you can kill an idea like this you can hurt its price but after you've heard it uh you've done all you can so from that that point on it's all it's all gross and positive yeah and it would legitimize it also right yeah. i think uh, that is an interesting part of the game theory like why why would you pay attention to someone that's uh, to something that's not uh important enough right so if they would really have an effort to kill it or you know close close the on-ramps and all these things this idea is already big enough to be defended by people worldwide i would say right so in that sense the the, the cat is out of the bag right <laughs> it can never be killed i mean even for this bit x right there's uh, people that are building these uh, little silos with um uh solar panels on it that you can put anywhere you know, and that's going to be, you know, maybe in total a three hundred dollar investment, and you can do your part in securing and decentralizing the Bitcoin network. And so, it, it can never be killed uh, anymore, right? It could have been killed in the beginning, but uh, but now it's it, it's already way way um, way too scattered and decentralized, I'd say. But we have to keep paying attention to keep it decentralized and secure, of course. But uh, yeah, interesting that that that. Uh, that's one I would uh, would say one of the final battles in your head, right? Like, can the government kill it? Uh, you know, <laughs> for me that's at like step twelve, maybe or something. But uh, I love I love that you got there first because I'd say that once you can reason that, it takes away other perhaps doubts or things that you uh, did not understand yet, right? Yeah, and then um, 
something I will add to the previous discussion is uh, I think last cycle I turn from an enthusiast to as a very active enthusiast and an educator. So I started um, writing about it in, in different languages and beginning to build a community. Mm -hmm. Little by little, we built an education platform and then turned it into 21st Capital, which is our work today. Um, and I remember myself hearing the same arguments from other people, you know, same thing, you know, government ban it or, or some other exotic things like uh, AI making it obsolete or quantum computing, killing it. And even though I had theoretically figured it out, like in 2020, in theory, it made sense. I would explain to people the game theory and why government is not a monolith and you're not going to have every government trying to you know, go after it in a very coordinated way. It's a fractured system. And unless mm -hmm. you can attack it from a million different ways, yeah. um, you, you, you can't do the, you can't kill it. Right. Yeah. And then it's fascinating to see four years later, um, that argument d died. And essentially we all saw that all the predictions and, and all the discussions that we would all the things that would we would explain to people at the theoretical level actually panned out and game theory is actually exactly going as we we predicted and at that time we weren't really sure we just we we just thought it's a very high likelihood right yeah but it's amazing that this all happened and little by little you know more and more of the questions are going away yeah yeah, it's very interesting to uh, to see that uh, game theory pr play out. I agree. It's uh, you know the the uh, if it's a threat for one country, it's an opportunity for another, right? So it, it there, there's never going to be any consensus in 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 killing it uh, altogether. Yeah, I I can imagine you have younger students, right? Do do they know you're into Bitcoin? Do you talk with them about Bitcoin? Do they ask you questions? Uh, it, it, very little. Uh, I try to keep my work uh, separate. I don't want to, uh, I have no interest in, you know, pushing anyone to Bitcoin without them first showing interest. It's probably a personality thing. You know, I, uh, I don't want to sell it. I'm like, if you, if you want it, I can tell it, I can tell you about it for hours, but I'm not going to push you. Uh, but something that, um, I see is that many young students, uh, they're not much into it. Um, I, I still see, you know, young people are, are a lot more familiar, but it's, it's still very rare for me to see someone who is, uh, you know, had real conviction. You know, many, many, many people have played with it. They, they know what it is, but they have, don't have much of an interest. Uh, and they probably don't see as much of a revolution in it yet, because there's obviously they're so young and they still have have not faced all the challenges that we you know we talk about about the economy and how the world works. Mm -hmm. So um, I do see a huge gap and a huge need for education and spreading the word uh, better and and. That's exactly, you know, what I, what I, what got me worried in the last cycle and made me, you know, try to do more on the education side, uh, in terms of writing and developing a platform and videos and things like that. But still, even in that young population, maybe 20 years old, 22 years old, um, you see a lot of, uh, distractions as well. Typically one of what, you know, I, I offer students uh, something like 30 or 40 possible uh, research topics for their final final uh, project. One of them is the blockchain and uh, Bitcoin. Uh, and so every few semesters, uh, someone really comes up with a great presentation. But most of the time, you see uh, uh, people getting distracted by what Google shows you, which is the ocean of... Um, other distraction coins, right? Yeah. <laughs> right. So they get a lot of bad information, and that's because uh, Bitcoiners um, 
probably haven't invested as much in in education and altcoins have invested a ton because they have nothing else they have that's to. all they <laughs> do it's it's all marketing you know yes, they yeah. die if they so and then they make a lot of easy money by by printing their token out of thin air and mm. that easy money turns into marketing ploys uh, i'm yet to see you know getting a spam a spam message on Twitter or something about, hey, let's buy this Bitcoin thing and it's going to go up. Never. No, no spam about Bitcoin, but uh, all kinds of other, uh, you know, meme coins and nonsense stuff uh, are getting pushed nonstop by bots. So yeah. why is that? Because there is easy money to be made and that money turns into, you know, fuel for marketing. And yeah. uh, we have to figure out how to fight this. Yeah, I, th I think eventually it's kind of like this natural selection. Uh, it's it's the same as you know the 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 the, the enterprise blockchain. Uh, a blockchain is useless when it's not permissionless, right? Uh, that's what I wanted to say before when you mentioned this. But I, I think it's the same thing, you know. And blockchain sounds fancy, and especially I think in the corporate world, it's uh, yeah, it's an easy ploy to to sell some consulting hours or some experiment, right? Uh, but eventually, yeah, if you're still in control of the database, then the application of blockchain is nothing more than a fancy demonstration of some sort of technology. Right? Yeah, let me let me add something. You know, they initially came out and said, let's use blockchain for sharing business data. Looks like this is a wonderful thing for data sharing. OK, yeah. but then they realized, oh, my God, we can't have our you know secret business data <laughs> public. OK, so let's invent this thing called permissioned blockchain yeah exactly so yeah. and then at that point it's basically a distributed it's database done. with passwords yeah. yes yeah it's funny how uh i really want to dive into your analysis but one more thing how is it possible that all these people in tech who are pretty deep in tech who try out new tech don't understand the, the severity of this technological discovery what is your take on that yeah, that's a fascinating question. You know, that's uh, and it's crazy. You see super, super smart people, but not being able to see the other side of the coin. And I think that the, the cause of that is uh, I can tell you from my own experience, you know, you, you get most of your expertise in one area. If you really want to be a great tech person, uh, the cost of that is not spending too much time learning about finance and economy. I mean, it, both topics are deep enough that will take all of your time. And if you want to have a real life and, you know, have some uh, other activities, there's only one thing you can be an expert in. So a tech guy would see, you know, the tech side of Bitcoin, which is not not extremely complex. Um, by, by comparison, Ethereum is, you know, much more complex and you can do all kinds of experiments and, you know, bleeding edge cryptography things. Uh, because that's a playground. And, and I was actually talking to one of the Ethereum developers a few weeks back, and he was exactly telling me this, you know, they said, it's so much fun. We can, we can experiment, we can apply the latest and, uh, 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 you know, most novel things, but we all know that this is all go, uh, gonna go away and eventually move to some more stable system like Bitcoin, but it's, it's still fun for a tech person. So I totally understand it. But if you as a tech person, you don't have that background in finance and economics and you can't really understand why, uh, what is it that, you know, sets Bitcoin apart from an economic perspective, then uh, it, I can easily see you distracted by the technological complexity of other systems. Right. But yeah. Uh, but but it, it, that's a challenge. You know, you have to understand two things at the same time, economic side of it and the tech side of it. Mm -hmm. and, and we don't have, you know, many people that can can go deep on both. Yeah. So what do you think is the biggest thing that people need to learn about the financial system? And why should they actually understand that part so they can see why Bitcoin has a relevance in this world? Um, I would say most people have this inherent trust that is programmed in their mind as they grow up. They trust the system, whatever, however you define it. You know, they trust that 
uh, there is somebody that will take care of us, uh, take care of money. You know, if they say this is what's needed to manage inflation, they're probably right. If they say 2% inflation is what we need, otherwise it's bad, they are right. They say, you know, deflation is a disaster for an economy. They're probably right. Um, and, and, you know, we need, we need banks. We need, so essentially we get, uh, hypnotized by what we have seen as we've been growing up. We see the existing system that was designed for us and we think that's the only possibility and that's the best possibility because otherwise yeah. otherwise someone else would have thought about it. Right? So most people are not able to you know, think outside this box that's created for them and realize that uh, you know, if you rely on a central party to take care of you, uh, they, they, at some point you will, you will, uh, you will wake up realizing that they actually were there in the first place to take care of themselves. You know, many people kind of got a taste of this in 08 or even at the COVID, COVID period. Uh, many of these institutions are there to keep their own, uh, power. Uh, and keep their own position going. That's the target. That's the optim. That's the optimization function. All they do is to make themselves look good. And what you know? What are the consequences for your life? The, that's all secondary to them. You know, they did all they could. They manipulated the currency during the COVID time to the to the max. Just because they were panicked, because they were not looking good, and people were asking them to, hey, you know, we're losing our jobs, let's do something about it. So they printed endless money and distributed to friends and family and ultimately regular people. Now, four years after that, we are living with the consequences. You know, many young people can't afford houses anymore. Food is expensive. Everything is a challenge now. Everything is short. Uh, most companies still haven't caught up. Many of us got, you know, pay cuts because uh, our pays are the same, but inflation has gone up. So imagine you get hired and your employer cuts your pay every year. That would be crazy, but that's exactly what's happening. And, and a lot mm -hmm. of people are, don't realize. Essentially, the way to answer your question is, I think the biggest thing people need to understand is the system is taking advantage of you while you are trained to trust it. Yeah. So, so kind of reprogram your mind and understand how to protect yourself against the system yeah i think that's a very good point right like uh and, and I mentioned this this before a lot but in in a western country the money also it it does work right you get some coins you as a kid you go to a store you get a bread or a juice or an ice cream and you know you think like okay this this is money but in in some way you are programmed to kind of like kill your curiosity or something right like you as as you said you accept that the system that is there is came there through trial and error or something, right? Like it's the best that could ever exist. So I should never question it. And uh, yesterday, like our last week, I had like a little trip down uh, the millennial subreddit and like uh, the subreddit of my country. And I was looking for people talking about this. It's amazing how many posts there are of people that are like mid twenties or early thirties that are like, I did everything that was told to me that I should have done, right? Good study, a master's, you know, I have a job, blah, 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 blah. Cannot afford a house, all these things. I don't want to have kids, like stuff like that. Why is everything getting some, uh, getting more expensive? Yesterday I saw a post that said like, are we all going broke? What is going on? You know, like it's, people understand something is happening, but in some way they, they, they don't connect it to, to the money and they are also not triggered in any sense to, yeah, I'd say like challenge the the belief that they were programmed, right? Or the, or the understanding, which is actually eventually very thin, right? Like the, the programming, there is no programming. That's the entire point, I'd say, right? It's just, these are the coins, these are the bills. You can go to a store, get a thing. Yeah, that, that's basically the education. Yeah, and uh, uh, it doesn't turn into conviction and action. Mm -hmm. that easily because you know the easiest path for anyone is the least resistance path is take what other people tell you as truth and just follow along you know everybody else did it so let's do it exactly and yeah. you only learn 
to do differently when you're badly burnt after years of going down the wrong path. And, and at that point, you realize, hey, hey maybe something is not working. Maybe I should take more responsibility and do things differently. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I think uh, 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 a nice current example of something that's proposed where lots of people are at least, at least media are, are applauding to, or, you know, in some way it's a, it's a very populist thing to say, but we saw Kamala Harris, you know, mention her entire price control plan against uh, price gogging and on all these things. Could you explain why that is such a bad idea? I saw you made a video about it, but also do you think it's dangerous to not talk about the actual core issue? I know they do it on purpose, but yeah, it, is it dangerous? I think it is. And the danger of it is the idea of price controls is appealing uh, to many people. Um, because when you go buy something and it's expensive and you can't buy it, it hurts. So it sounds like the easiest way to solve that is to force the other party to sell it to you at a lower price. Yeah. But that's that's where your economic understanding stops, because then you have you haven't thought at all about how that price is formed. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would say many politicians are they don't even have a deep understanding of this. And if they do, uh, they are, you know, the best case is they, they have some knowledge of this, but they intentionally want to mislead us. The danger here is it it is likely to, to be adopted and be popular by the masses. And we know democracies are vulnerable to uh, mass psychosis and, and uh, the madness of the of the people. So if you come up with a super popular idea that gets you to vote, that can easily be, you know, turn into real laws and real rules that will uh, change the course of a country. With the price control, uh, kind of continuing on what we were explaining before, they, the collection of all the policies that they took packaged under helping the little guy. You know, the whole reason Federal Reserve got involved and did anything after COVID was to save the little guy. Why is that? Because, you know, over the last 100 years, we have realized that if you let, if you leave the economy to its own devices, it has some ups and downs and ups are great, but when downs happen, people lose their jobs. So if we don't do anything, well, a lot of people will suffer. And then we'll have, we will have riots in the streets. So let's, let's try to do something. And what they do is because they're not productive, you know, government, uh, in its entirety makes nothing, does nothing. It simply redistributes. It, 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 it is a mechanism that takes my taxes and pays it, you know, to some other economically productive actor to do something. Yeah. So all they do is just move resources around. And then also, you know, as an aside, then then they come back and brag to us about, we did this, we did that. You did nothing. You just got, took my taxes, gave it to someone else, and that someone else did whatever you think you did. But separate from that, um, uh, the, the collection of all the policies that they took after COVID caused you know, the problem of inflation that we have. Now they're using, instead of that becoming a lesson for us to kind of limit the power of these people, they're actually using the, reversing the story and saying, hey, now we have a m bigger problem. So you got, got to give us even more power to do more manipulation and more intervention in the economy to fix it. Um, super simplistic way, you know, instead of explaining the money, how money works and how money supply causes inflation, the easiest thing to say is, uh, you know, prices are high and the sellers are taking advantage of you. And a lot of people would agree with it. I'm happy that at least, you know, a significant portion of people laugh at these ideas, but a very dangerous number also like the idea. They think all these companies are taking advantage of us. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying they're not greedy or they're, you know, altruistic, you know, economy can't live can't can survive based on altruism. Everybody's greedy. Everybody's taking out, you know, looking out for themselves. That's how it should be. We, that's how we are designed. You know, everybody has to do what they 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 know best, and they they yeah. realize it's 
it's good for them. But the beauty of the economy is it works despite all of us being selfish. And, uh, uh, but, you know, the idea that companies are uh, increasing prices is, is the, the biggest danger, I would say, is that if it's enacted, it will immediately lead to many businesses leaving, uh, leaving that industry uh, and then laying off people. And that means shortage, less products available for everyone. So ironically, actually, everything will get more expensive. And then government will get even more involved because now they have a bigger, they have to bring in a bigger hammer to to punish uh, sellers. So you, you will see government quickly growing, more intervention, more mm -hmm. action, more control, and you'll have gigantic organizations built to control and police economic activities. So that's another cost that will itself create more problems in the economy. So my biggest concern is this, type of action will destroy the productive engine of the economy. It will destroy the heart of the economy. It will make make work less profitable for businesses and push them out. And that's exactly why, you know, the economies that work well, work well because many entities in those places, they have the right incentives. Mm -hmm. They They are productive they spend their time and resources very well to make people around them happier. But policies like this actually reverse that and break the incentives, break the incentive for work and productivity for everyone. And the consequence, this is the most dangerous thing, uh, a policy that destroys the fabric of the economy. And, and that's, that was my motivation to, to try to, you know, I spread the word a little bit about it as much as I can, but. We can also get into get into the economics of this, but I'm you know in 21st century we shouldn't be we shouldn't be uh, having politicians that propose these ideas. Yeah, I think one of the biggest eye openers for myself was when I realized that you know from my memory from high school economy you know we had to calculate stuff you know but once I realized that economics is basically a social science. Right, it's how people interact with each other. It also dawned on me that it doesn't really make much sense that you would want to try and adjust human behavior, use human needs, human wants, right, human incentives with rules on paper, and then stack them on top of each other to mold the behavior of people in some way that they on paper, right, would behave in the way that you want them to behave, right? That 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 sounds so far away from, yeah, also my understanding of a free market or capitalism is like everyone can do whatever they want. If my cakes are better than yours, you have to quit. I have success and, and you go figure out something else to do, right? Like that sounds like a way more, you know, I'm, I'm oversimplifying, but a way more straightforward and clear approach than, okay, now there's this rule, then there's this tax. Um, and, and as you said, the government itself is not productive, right? They, they should follow a strategy that they propose that the people uh, ag agree to. Uh, yeah, that's, that's basically it, right? Also, you again, know, they, a bit simplifying, they, but yeah. They are extremely arrogant in the sense that they think they can engineer the proper outcomes Exactly. Uh, yeah. By For calculation the and comp. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then, and then they, they will say, you know, we are the smartest people. We can hire these PhDs and we can design the perfect system. And, uh, you know, most of the time it's uh, the, they get the reward and applause for it. And then if it doesn't work, uh, they don't pay for it. Uh, it's the regular people that would pay the consequences of uh, yeah. their perfect design not working. Yeah, because of course, not not like Christine Lagarde says, right? Like inflation does not come out of nowhere. <laughs> you know, it's yeah. obviously the consequence of certain uh, policy or the decision to create debt, create um, you know new new money supply, etc. That's also what we see, of course, in the in the US. Right, every hundred days we see one trillion added to the national debt. On paper, they have plans to eventually. You know, or at least that's what they say. <laughs> Pay it off, right? We sell government treasuries or yeah, bonds, and uh, yeah, eventually we will we will figure it out. But right, 
can you share in the simplest way possible this how this unfathomable uh number will never be repaid and the fact that america is actually in a debt cycle right they raise more debt to pay the interest on the old debt but because they have to do that other countries are less confident in buying their debt so that will slowly unwind but the, the old debt of course will stay alive in interest payments on that too yeah it's a it's a disastrous uh self-perpetuating cycle you know going back to there is a fundamental problem with how um, a democracy works uh, and that is there is always this force to overspend there is no no uh, demand from the populace to spend less because mm -hmm. uh it is it's it's kind of like the um tragedy of the commons the the because government collects all these taxes and all these sources of revenues that becomes a common resource and everybody tries to take as much as possible out of it at the expense of others and if everybody everywhere is trying to take more and more well you eventually run out and there will be endless demand for making more and more money for all these different interest groups everyone wants more resources nobody nobody says i want less resources right so this pushes the system to spend more than it has and unfortunately after the fiat uh, fiat development um we can spend more than we have and we always do that so governments you know uh, a typical budget year is probably like they spend five trillion, six trillion, and they earn only maybe four mm -hmm. or three trillions. There's a big gap between uh, expense and uh, and revenue. Um, how do they cover the ex the gap? They borrow, and every year there's more and more borrowed. But borrowing means they issue bonds. Those bonds are purchased by uh, some of it is by different organizations, institutions, investors, and different countries and central banks and all kinds of things around the world. But on those bonds, you have to pay a, um, an interest, a coupon, right? And so that's, uh, you know, depending on a, depending on the kind of bonds, right now we, we go from four to 3%. Uh, and and it, as as they raise rates, it it goes higher and higher. So the government, because they bought so much, they have to pay this constant amount of interest. That interest becomes another cost itself, and it's never going away, right? And it adds to the deficit next year. So to fix that deficit, which is now more, you have to borrow even more next year because mm -hmm. you're not really raising your revenues at all. You're not going to tax people more. At least it's very unpopular, although we are hearing, you know, people wanting to do that. And, and they're not going to reduce their costs. So the deficit will continue. But every year you add that exp interest expense on top of it. And then because you have to borrow more to cover that, then the next year's interest expense would be even higher. So this turns into a cycle where every year you're just adding more and more. And there's no way you can reduce the um, you can reduce the uh, the deficits and the and the debt, and you keep borrowing and you keep paying interest, and that makes your economy less and less profitable because money is uh, is not going to people who are making goods and services. Money is going to people who have bar who have lent the government more assets previously, and that money actually in turn becomes a stimulative even if the federal reserve wants to raise rates first of all this dynamic pushes them to not be able to raise the rates that much yeah uh because then they because they will be able to borrow more right? bankrupt the government yeah mm -hmm. but after that even the rate hikes won't have any effect at that point because the more government pays on their debt the more money is distributed so you just said there's one trillion of interest expense where does that go it goes to people who have lent it to the government the previous years and those people now get one trillion dollars of free money easy money 
to spend. So, so at some point, your ability to even play that game of hiking rates and you know slowing that economy that that doesn't even work. So you get into yeah. this permanent state of expansion. So the system that we've designed has only one way now. It only has to expand and you know expand the money supply and devalue the currency, and that's the only way the governments can survive because. They can't pay the debt back, but they can devalue the currency so their debt is looks yeah. smaller. Yeah, yeah. I it's so interesting. I don't have a finance or economics background, but for me, this is just pure gaslighting, right? It's like on paper there is growth, right? The the number goes up, the nominal numbers go up, GDP goes up, and all these things, but it's it's not real productivity, right? It's a number. It's it's not connected to to the real world, you know. And and also to add to that, I read that uh, people in America work one day a week to eventually pay taxes that help their government pay uh, interest on 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 debt, right? But that's older debt. So basically, let's say you're thirty now, right? You're a millennial in the U.S. You work every Monday. You work. To let your government to help your cover, government pay for interest on the debt they took that they spent on something that you probably did not benefit from in your life at all, right? You you probably never drove on the road or the bridge or you know whatever they spend it on, and that to me is just fascinating. That that conversation is not alive, basically, right? Like no yeah. one thinks about that point. Exactly, and that's by no, that's not by chance. Because people who talk about it don't get the funds, don't get celebrated, don't get invited to to the talks, and um, they can't publish, you know, material related to this. So, challenging the status quo is not popular and, and doesn't get the resources. And uh, that's how we continuously get the wrong ideas and the wrong education. Yeah. So, what's your you know, this is the problem. What is your favorite mental model for explaining Bitcoin? Why is it a solution to this? Uh, yeah, very good one. Um, actually, we built a great foundation so far. You know, we realized that governments are digging a hole that uh, it just gets bigger and bigger every year. There's no way out of this. There's no way they can reduce the deficit and there's no way they can really slow the strain down. So they will just have to print more and more, borrow more and more, and there would be more money moving around the world. So if you do nothing, this will kill you by a thousand cuts. Slowly, you know, every year you're, you get pay cuts. Again, the, the way to think about it is you just got pay cut, and every year I'm outraged because automatic, the pay cut is automatic, but then you have to go th negotiate and do all kinds of tricks to to keep up, which you typically can't as a worker unless you change your job. Uh, but in this dynamic, uh, doing nothing is not an option. That's the first first thing. You know, most people are being robbed if they want to just you know live their cozy life and 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 not think about it. Uh, when fiat expands, every other asset that has more limited supply than the fiat will grow. And one of the best examples of this is, uh, you know, you can think of uh, housing, for example. Housing has done a not a bad job keeping up with inflation. Uh, but even like something as dumb as shark teeth, shark teeth that was acting as money in, um, you know, a village in Australia, in even that, because of, because of the limited supply, even that increased in value after they printed so much money after, uh, in the aftermath of 2008. So it actually a, a universal formula. If when fiat expands, any other asset that has more limited supply uh, absorbs that extra liquidity. And so in, if you understand this, you want to be in a place where you have the maximum limitation on the on the supply expansion, which is obviously Bitcoin. You know, this is the theoretically, uh, theoretically and mathematically uh, fixed. Nothing else in the world 
is as fixed as Bitcoin, right? Bitcoin is fixed by math, but anything else you want to fix by by some kind of physical limit, uh, there are there are ways around it, and people can always find more and more resources in the vast universe. So um, that's where that's where you want to be. But also any other kind of asset that has more limited supply, they will do more. They will they will perform more. So if you look at the asset classes, you know gold is actually not doing a bad job. You know compared to the S and P five hundred, I was I was looking at uh, the the volatility versus return of these assets. Gold is returning almost the same as S and P in the last few years, but with much less volatility. So turn has turned out to be you know a, a really good proposition after COVID. But then you you got stocks as well. Stocks are also do do very well because uh, they're just absorbing the liquidity. It's not like actually if you look at the data, companies aren't making aren't much more productive than they were before. But the numbers are going up just because the stocks are are you know one way to hedge against the supply expansion. Mm-hmm. Housing, uh, uh, you know, whatever thing that's hard for a manufacturer to create is a good place to be. But you know, you all also always want to ride the fastest horse, which is which is Bitcoin. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting that uh, I think the stock uh, the stock thing is interesting, right? A lot of people think like, oh, I should I should invest in stocks, <laughs> uh, but it's basically why why is it going up? It's because people are parking their money there because the 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 money itself lost the the ability to be saved in. Right. You know, this is a, this is one of those crazy stories. People think they can just put money in the stocks and and uh, and with no effort make a lot of money a few years later. They, it it's as closest as possible to a to a free lunch. They think you know we invested, but all they're doing is they're just benefiting from the money supply expansion. Yeah, exactly. There, yeah, there's no guaranteed point. investment. There's no free lunch. The fact that anything you invest in goes up should should you know uh, should have your alarm alarms go off and you, you got to realize that if you know all the stocks are going up that's only because you know the whole the whole system is expanding and you're not you're not necessarily making any money if it's a real investment it should be risky but, <laughs> but they've taken exactly. away the risk yeah. which means somebody else is taking all that risk yeah, very good point, right? Saving should be non-risk and investing is obviously risk, but building wealth has become synonymous with investing, not saving, right? Because that is just not possible anymore. But I also think that's a part of the conversation that is almost never talked about, right? People just say, you know, put it in some t- some type of S&P 500 tracker and it will go up forever. But but they forget the last part of the sentence, uh, uh, which is because the denominator is going down uh, forever, right? So your number, your nominal number, is going up, but the value in essence is going down. I love that when you look at uh, on Trading View at, for example, the Nasdaq. If you denominate that in M two money supply, you see, and and you know that would represent closest to the real value, how it's valued, right? You see that we are now, although nominally in dollars, it's almost all time high. If you put it in M2 money supply, it's lower than the peak of the dot com bubble, which arguably is just, you know, factually wrong because we have way better tech 24 years after the dot com bubble. But just because the dollar denominator lost all that value. Uh, it's actually valued lower than at the peak of the dot com bubble, which, you know, is a whole nother part that we can go into, right? One but of the, the yeah. one of the biggest one of the biggest scamish stories is they tell you if you put in this much money, you know, the, thirty uh, years, yeah, <laughs> yeah, for thirty years in in this S and P, thirty years later you're gonna be a millionaire, man. You know, a million is gonna be what a thousand dollars is. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's what they don't tell you. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. So with with your firm, 21st Capital, you recently educated uh, an entire family that wanted to adopt Bitcoin. What are like the general concerns and questions you hear when you do something like that? And how do you mitigate them? 
Yeah, so in this case, uh, this was a family that had that reached out to us for um, advising and consulting on on both sides of the coin, essentially both on the economics part of Bitcoin and the technology and custody. So we designed a custom course for them. And the uh, 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 first half of it was about uh, economy and money. And we, we actually began from a cave caveman economy. Like we began from an economy that, is you know in the most primitive sense and then we expanded it and brought in money and that way we demonstrated how money works and in the in a village of of uh, you know primitive human being how can uh how can money supply work and what what are the impacts of it then we expanded it into you know a more modern economic system and the idea of uh you know fiat system and expansion and why this whole economic theory of uh, always inflation um, came about what are the what are the reasons what are the goals and what are the outcomes and as you said one of the main outcomes of it is um uh you know many investments are now uh, spurious you know you, you think you're making money nominally but it's not happening and we actually adjusted many investment performance uh, charts by inflation and then showed them that, you know, many of these investments actually are underperforming the inflation. And by the end of it, uh, it was a family of four, dad and, and wife and two kids. And by the end of it, that, that dad was like, this whole system is a scam. I'm like, yes, now you're getting it, you know, unless <laughs> you're ding, ding. outraged, yeah. unless you're outraged. I can't say it in the beginning because it sounds like a conspiracy, but once you exactly. really understand how it's working, the only conclusion is, you know, I'm being scammed. And, yeah. uh, and and you're being left left uh, alone. And uh, for uh, for that, and then we followed up with the technicals, you know, actually showing them how to move money and how to store it. And I, you know, from my, uh, I sent them some money. They sent it to you know other family members, and then moved some uh, Bitcoin around and put it in wallets and uh, went uh, you know followed followed along uh, uh, in all the steps from how to how to you know theoretical part of understanding the keys and private keys and public keys and seed phrases and how wallets work and and actually doing it hands on but to answer your question specifically some other you know i think a, a big challenge for them and most families that we talk to most people that we got we talk to is the technicals uh, the fact that you take full control of your money, you know, fully takes you out of that trust mindset that, you know, I'm trusting my bank. There's somebody that's uh, that that has my back if, if, if something goes wrong. But now all the responsibility is shifting for me. Money is in my own hand. But what if I mess it up? So we have to be very, uh, very careful in explaining to people that if you use the right tools, if you have the right education, if you have the right you know, resources, you can there, uh, you, you can do this pretty, pretty safely and pretty comfortably. But that only happens if you understand it, right? You have to fully understand how how the math works and that you are relying on mathematics. Yeah. And if you if you if you kind of go deep enough on it, you can you can be sure that this is more more resistant than any other bank or any other governmental system that that supposedly has your back. Yeah, I love that family context, right? Where where you have the parents and the children, and I think there's also something Sailor says, right? Like yeah, all the economic energy that you gathered and and you, that you have today, how are you going to save that for for three or four or five gener generations, right? Or a thousand uh, years? Like, does your bank still exist in a hundred years? I think is a great great question, and I think once you go into the technicals of Bitcoin, you can actually show that yes, this would actually exist in a hundred years. Right. And it gives you, it does give you that new responsibility back, but it also gives you more certainty about the future. Right. I think that's an interesting trade off to, to, uh, and, to and we're about. also doing great work. You know, every day the custody methods are improving and we are adding more and more capabilities. Uh, right now, I wouldn't say it's super easy, but it's getting there. Like m one of the most recent technologies is, you know, using mini scripts like Liana Wallet does that, uh, that, built in the inside the blockchain uh the ability for you to recover your funds so to very simplified the way it works is you build a base wallet but 
if that uh, if that address is is uh, is not used for a certain amount of time, the money automatically is moved to a second address. So the way it can help you is if you lose everything, you know, you've had all the backups, you've done all the things right, but you know you were just unlucky and you lost everything. Six months later, it's moving to your backup address and you still have it. Great for you know peace of mind. Yeah. Essentially, very difficult to lose your money in that system. And then also great for legacy planning. If you, you know, God forbid, die or something happens, uh, automatically your heirs get the thing. So we are getting more and more of these technologies that make it easier for the average person. Some of the models that we have developed for Bitcoin um, uh, and the way they work is they look at the growth since the beginning up to now and they extrapolate it. So this is already, you gotta be very careful. You are assuming that the past growth will continue into the future, mm -hmm. okay? With that caveat, if that goes on, uh, or the model is predict, the model is saying for now, the price should, the fair price is above $70,000, actually more accurately, 74,000. So if you draw a trend line since the birth of Bitcoin up to now, and the trend line goes through the middle of the data, sometimes in bull market, it's kind of, below it and in bear markets it's above it uh if you extend that to now it's predicting seventy four thousand as the fair price and we are well below it yeah we're at 60 you said right so 61 uh, something yeah yeah and if you continue that into the future you are passing 100 easily in the later parts of this year and and uh, uh a quantile regression analysis that I, I i just talked about on another chat this morning and I'll be posting about that more. That one is demonstrating that the expected distribution of the price next year should be somewhere between in the range of 50 to 250. It's a huge range, but the median of that range is at 110. Yeah. So um, you also don't need <laughs> any of this math for that, right? Essentially, we all know that the system is expanding uh, all the time and uh, Bitcoin will, will continue to grow. The bear markets essentially are pauses in that growth, just because, you know, a few months back, we had so much growth after the ETFs came, came along, you know, we moved from 16K to 75K. And most of that, I actually had a chart that timestamped the ETF events with the growth of the price. And a lot of the jumps in the price happened because of the ETF. So we kind of got a lot of push early and because of that, the price of that is getting a, a, a consol consolidation for a while. Mm -hmm. So if you're just in that period, the lower it goes, the happier I'll be because it's just, uh, you know, it's uh, it's more energy that's being compressed and just ready to explode. Yeah. And another thing I'll say is if you look at the futures market, many of the traders are have capitulated. In the past few weeks, several days, for several days, we've had negative funding rate. Basically means that most traders have switched from being long to being short. And that's also a wonderful sign showing that, you know, leverage players are are giving up. And that's exactly what we need to, to move up. Yeah. Last two questions. Do you think, uh, you know, these ETFs launched eight months ago, they have 17 billion year to date, which I think the biggest prediction was 20 billion for the first year. So that will probably be beat. How do you see their impact evolve on price and supply and the narrative, I would say? So when you look at the chart, you see that there was this huge rush of capital after ETFs were approved, about $12 billion suddenly came in for the first quarter. Then we had a pause, then we had two, three billion dollars, then we had a pause, another two, three billion dollars got to us, uh, got us to, to 17 billion. And now we are in another pause. So I'm expecting this to just continue to exactly the same way into the next few years. We will get a few billion dollars, a little bit of pause, a few billion dollars. It's going to slow down just a little bit, but not so much because we still have a lot of institutions that are doing their due diligence and they're studying Bitcoin and they're just going through the legal process of having everybody in this organization on board to buy more and more. And also, if you look at 13 of filings, We've had a th more than 1,000 institutions, which is a which is a 15% growth from 870 something that we saw in the previous quarter. 
invested in Bitcoin. The number of institutions is increasing. The amount that everybody is invested is increasing. So this actually, you know, is just getting started. And yeah. it's it's not one of those things that, you know, explodes and then goes away. It, it's mm -hmm. going to stabilize and for a very long time bring fresh capital into the Bitcoin ecosystem. Yeah. Yeah, I I love the term the train has left the station, right? But I think it's a it it it's good for people to also share, right? Like if you still have your doubts, if you still need to study, if you still think it's a scam, uh, Ponzi, you know, tulip something, something, you know, this is actually happening. Unfortunately, the finance bros figured it out. I always say, right? So you need to you need to study this because it's not it's not it's it's just not going away. And it's the most important thing you should you should ever study, I think. So, uh, yeah, very interesting to hear where that's at. I'd love to continue the conversation when uh, perhaps we are further in the year, or maybe when we touch the 100K, I think that would be a great moment to uh, to reflect. I know you're tight on time, so I want to ask you the last question that I ask everyone, which is, what is a core belief that you will never let go? The sanctity of human freedom. So the idea that freedom... Uh, makes the world better for everybody. Love that. I think that's a great ending. I will link to your Twitter X account. I will link to 21st Capital so people can check it out. And uh, I want to thank you for this conversation. I really appreciate your time. Thanks a lot. This was an amazing chat. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, also make sure to check out this video right here or go to my page and check out all the episodes of Bitcoin for Millennials. I appreciate your support and hope to see you for another episode. Bye. Oh,